Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on Is a COA Right for Your Public Safety Department? Before we begin, please be sure to mute yourself just to eliminate any background noise during the webinar. Also, if you think of any questions, please feel free to submit them in the chat section on your screen, and we will answer as many questions as we can during our Q&A session at the end. So I know many of you are from um, a public safety department who's trying to or is in the process of implementing a drone program. You may have already learned that there's a lot of steps that go into this process, and it can get confusing at times. One question that we always get at Dart Drones is, what is the difference between Part 107 versus a Certificate of Authorization, and what's the right move for my public safety department? So this is the question that we're going to completely break down in today's webinar. We'll also go through some real-world examples so that you leave with a good grasp on which is better for your department. So today's speaker, who is actually going to be covering this topic, is Colin. Colin is a private pilot and advanced ground instructor and holds a master's degree in UIS design and operations from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. He was a skydiving instructor for multiple years with over 1,500 recorded jumps and currently owns and operates a drone services company in Pennsylvania with a focus on mapping and inspections. Um, Colin is our chief pilot and operations consultant here at Dart Drones. He has extensive knowledge on today's topic and has consulted with numerous departments on Part 107 and obtaining COAs. So I will now pass it over to Colin and he'll jump into today's topic. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Alicia. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, just uh, to confirm, got a good uh, sound check there? Yes, thanks. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, welcome again, everyone, and uh, happy to, that uh, you joined us today. Um, hopefully, we can uh, answer some questions and, and clarify some things for you as far as uh, whether or not uh, uh, going after a certificate of authorization uh, for public use uh, is uh, the, the best option for your um, unmanned aircraft program, uh, or uh, see if uh, perhaps Part 107 uh, is uh, the better way uh, to look at things at this point. So, we're going to go ahead and uh, jump right into this. So as Alicia uh, mentioned, um, there are two avenues uh, that are available uh, to uh, many um, public uh, safety departments and other uh, government entities, public entities, uh, to operate uh, small unmanned aircraft systems uh, or unmanned aircraft systems in general uh, right now, not necessarily uh, small, uh, within our national airspace system. Uh, and uh, we already discussed uh, the two of those uh, with uh, the, the uh, COA or uh, Part 1. So, you know, really, um, you know, as far as the COA is concerned, um, what Certificate of Authorization stands for, what it does basically is um, it's a way that uh, an entity that would wish to conduct some sort of aviation activity uh, within our national airspace system that goes sort of beyond the scope or outside of the scope uh, of standard federal aviation regulations. Um, this is a way that they can get permission uh, to be able to conduct those operations. And, um, you know, for a variety of different reasons, which we're going to get into, you know, often public entities uh, are pursuing uh, these certificates of authorization because of the unique nature um, of, you know, one of the facets of their operations or the areas where they need to operate um, and, and really just a general need to go beyond uh, what's covered in our in our baseline provisions uh, within the FARs. So, you know, um, the biggest benefit uh, to going after the public uh, use COA, um, you know, or, or I should say the agencies that are going to benefit uh, the most from from the public use uh, COA are uh, local municipalities, fire departments, police departments, um, you know, other first responders, search and rescue groups, um, and certain other uh, publicly funded entities uh, like public schools and, and things like that. Um, but uh, as we'll see here in a little bit, Bit, you know what what comes down to the uh, the determining factor uh, you know really comes into you know what uh, what is the function of the agency and can it be deemed an essential uh, governmental function so uh, it when you obtain a COA you know one of the benefits of this is that uh, once it's uh, obtained um, you'll be able to act to uh, operate uh, under a variety of different conditions uh, that may give you actually give you the opportunity to go 
go beyond what is covered in the standard uh, federal aviation regulations right now. Um, so, you know, um, really the, the biggest thing, the biggest benefit that we see with this, uh, you know, up until this point uh, has been for those uh, organizations that uh, need to operate um, within areas of controlled airspace on a regular basis. So if you are responsible for a jurisdiction uh, where there is, um, you know, either a, a large area of controlled airspace or multiple uh, areas of controlled airspace, um, and, you know, you need to be able to uh, deploy that aircraft uh, in support of your missions um, very, very quickly, then uh, obviously, you know, the process of going through traditional airspace authorizations or um, obtaining uh, various waivers for your operations operations uh, on uh, potentially a case-by-case -case or flight-by-flight -flight basis isn't going to make sense, you know, um, and this is especially true with first responders. Uh, when an issue comes up, you know, you need to be able to address that immediately, uh, and um, having this uh, certificate of authorization, um, and we're going to talk about some of the different types of these certificates of authorization, um, could give you the ability to do that without having to wait uh, for additional um, special approvals uh, from uh, the FAA if you're flying under the traditional um, FARs found in, in Part 107 when we're talking about unmanned aircraft right now. So, uh, you know, some, some of the things that are typically included in these uh, public use certificates of authorization, one, um, night operations, uh, so, and this is uh, uh, basically has become pretty much a standard uh, in not only the jurisdictional uh, COA, uh, but also the more basic blanket uh, COA. Um, in that uh, both daytime and nighttime uh, um, operations would be allowed, provided that uh, weather conditions uh, are uh, are favorable for that. Um, also, uh, in certain cases, uh, because you are uh, operating these systems uh, in public areas uh, in response to different types of public emergencies, um, incidental flight over non-participants, uh, or you know, um, being able to operate where non-participants may be in the immediate vicinity. Uh, uh, these can also be incorporated into uh, these uh, public use COA requests. Um, again, especially if uh, looking at this from a uh, emergency services or, or first responder point of view. Um, also, uh, larger unmanned aircraft systems. Uh, so certain government agencies um, have a need to operate systems that may go uh, outside of the scope of uh, your uh, your small unmanned aircraft that's covered by under Part 107, um, meaning uh, an aircraft that weighs less than 50 55 pounds. So if uh, larger uh, aircraft are needed or the need to fly beyond visual line of sight uh, or other advanced types of operations uh, that, you know, either would have to um, uh, Require certain waivers uh, if operating under Part 107, uh, or just you know would not be allowed altogether under Part 107. Uh, the public use COA may give uh, a better option uh, and give you a pathway at least uh, to pursue uh, those operational uh, parameters. So uh, moving on to the next slide. Um, so the overall process of how to go about requesting uh, one of these COAs uh, begins basically by uh, going to the FAA's online uh, public use uh, COA application services website, uh, which is called the CAPS uh, system. And uh, the website uh, is uh, caps.faa.gov. Um, when you go in there, you will uh, initially create uh, an account uh, and you're going to basically request access um, into uh, the CAP system. So you'll go ahead and you'll establish an account uh, and then um, shortly thereafter uh, you'll get uh, an email um, from uh, from uh, the FAA and uh, they will uh, instruct you to um, basically complete a form uh, documenting uh, who you are, uh, what entity uh, you are working with, um, and uh, submit that form uh, so that uh, your request uh, for access can be approved and and uh, you'll be assigned um, basically a, uh, an FAA coordinator uh, that will guide you through the process or give you uh, some information on the various pieces of information that you're going to have to prepare uh, and submit to them so that that can be uh, reviewed and uh, your case can be basically adjudicated or evaluated uh, uh, in order to get uh, your various um, your various COAs. So uh, there are three types of um, public use COAs uh, that are most common. 
uh, right now and uh, for public uh, safety agencies. And those are the blanket COA, uh, which is considered uh, the baseline or, or basic uh, COA. Uh, there's a jurisdictional COA, uh, which allows for access to um, you know, air, larger areas of controlled airspace, uh, allows for flights uh, you know, closer to airports that have control towers on a regular basis without the need for special permissions. Uh, and uh, then finally, um, the uh, emergency uh, COA, which uh, basically would allow someone with a jurisdictional COA that perhaps has a need to uh, conduct some sort of operation that would go beyond the terms of that jurisdictional access. Uh, we give them basically a one-time authorization to be able to do that. Uh, so those are those are the three types. And you know, from our experience in uh, recent years, uh, or I should say, more like recent months, uh, especially since we've seen you know some of uh, the the um, uh, regulations or the parameters, operating parameters associated with uh, Part 107 uh, come out, and then also start to expand. Really, the jurisdictional COA uh, seems to be the most common and uh, the one that most uh, agencies that come to us uh, de decide that they. They would like to pursue um, and, and that's typically because of airspace issues uh, and things like that so um, to, to start off the process you know once you've uh, created this account and you've submitted the form to the FAA to verify your identity and, and what entity you're working with, uh, you're going to receive an email from uh, one of these coordinators uh, at the FAA, and uh, they're going to give you some details on uh, the, this process and you know how, what you're going to need to start preparing uh, to submit uh, your different uh, pieces of paperwork. So um, things that you're going to be working on initially, what they're going to recommend that you do if you haven't already done this uh, is um, develop uh, what's called a concept of operation. Uh, so basically, develop the uh, the detailed uh, overview of what type of operations you intend to conduct, um, the goals uh, of those particular uh, applications or, or of these uh, flights that you would wish to uh, conduct, um, the different strategies and, and tactics, uh, things like that uh, that uh, will influence your flight, um, any uh, you know internal uh, organizations, um, activities, uh, and uh, basically who's going to be responsible uh, for the overall administration of this program. Um, then you're going to review uh, the uh, various technologies uh, that you'd like to use. So you will need to document uh, in this request um, what type of aircraft systems you're going to be using, uh, so who the manufacturer is, uh, what uh, their, their performance specifications are, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, they do recommend that uh, you do both a cost benefit analysis and a uh, put together a community acceptance plan or um, obtain community buy-in for this program uh, if you are a, a public agency uh, prior to going ahead and, and submitting all the documentation for approval. Um, you know, obviously, when we start out talking about unmanned aircraft, um, this is a very new piece of technology and there are still a lot of people that uh, are afraid of it uh, and they believe that when we operate these systems we're going to be spying on them uh, you know these these aircraft are going to be gathering data uh, just innately about, about what they do in their day-to-day -day lives and you know we know that that's not the purpose um, of, of what we're doing here you know and that uh, a little bit it, uh, potentially more science fiction uh, than fact uh, as far as what uh, the systems are capable of doing at this point when we talk about uh, the most common ones that are in use. Um, but it is very important uh, to make sure you go through that process. Um, once uh, you've uh, touched base with this coordinator, uh, they're going to also give you instructions on uh, how to uh, obtain what's called a public letter of declaration. So the public letter of declaration is actually uh, going to be the next step uh, that you should pursue prior to going ahead and, and uh, crafting uh, the different documents that you're going to submit uh, to the FAA. So this letter is going to come from uh, either your state uh, attorney general's office uh, or local district attorney's office, something like that. And uh, it's going to define uh, you and, and your agency as a public entity, uh, as a government, public governmental entity uh, that uh, 
is is uh, tasked with uh, a particular role to ensure uh, the public well-being, um, basically. So this this uh, public letter of declaration is needed and must be submitted to the FAA before they're going to then allow you to you know fully go through the process of uh, submitting all of your information and, and issuing a final approval uh, on uh, this uh, this overall uh, your overall COA. Uh, so um, once you prepare that uh, letter and it is uh, sent. Um, you're going to send uh, a copy of that uh, directly to the FAA, uh, the, the signed uh, original copy from the uh, Attorney uh, General or District Attorney's Office, uh, as well as email a copy of that uh, to your coordinator um, at the FAA. Um, once that uh, document is reviewed and approved, uh, um, that's you know really the uh, one of the primary pieces. Uh, oftentimes they will allow you to start uh, submitting materials uh, but, um, while that document is being reviewed. Um, but uh, again, nothing can be finalized uh, until uh, that uh, public letter of declaration is in place because uh, one of the the key components of this is to be eligible for a public uh, COA. Um, the FAA there are, there are certain parameters that are outlined in the Code of Federal Regulations in uh, Title 49 uh, that define um, a, you know, a, an essential uh, governmental function, uh, which is really what you have to prove that your agency is doing. So, you know, as long as you are, um, you know, mandate, you have a mandate from either a local, state, or federal government, uh, you know, body uh, that gives you uh, that jurisdiction, you know, uh, or that authorization, um, that's what you want to do. Sometimes where uh, people run into roadblocks with this and uh, where determinations are made that uh, on the FAA side that uh, that your agency may not be um, uh, able to receive or eligible for a public uh, UCOA is if the role of your organization uh, you know, would not uh, meet the definition of an essential uh, government agency uh, in the eyes of uh, the federal government, the FAA, um, or uh, if let's say you operate not so much uh, as a direct, um, you know, so, uh, a direct um, component of a, of a government, but instead as a conglomerate uh, of different agencies working together for a particular purpose. Um, so if uh, your public safety agency is, uh, let's say, part of some sort of coalition uh, of different groups that provide services in, in different parts uh, or regions of, you know, your state, whatever the case might be, um, that may bring into question whether or not you will be able to pursue uh, the public use uh, COA. So um, as far as going beyond then the letter of uh, declaration, you're also then going to put together an executive summary, uh, which is going to include that concept of operations uh, that you would have been uh, preparing as you're getting ready uh, to submit uh, this material. You are going to submit a full description of your unmanned aircraft system or systems. Uh, so whichever aircraft uh, that you intend to use uh, at the start of this program, you will need to submit um, detailed information about that. Uh, so including things like um, you know, a description of the aircraft, what type of aircraft is it? Is it a multi-rotor? Is it a fixed wing? Um, is it what is the ground control station interface? Is it a computer? Is it a handheld transmitter uh, like uh, we commonly use with many small systems? Um, what uh, data link uh, communication? So what is the communication system? What frequencies are used, et cetera? Um, and uh, also the registration information for the aircraft. So you will need to go on and register that uh, via the FAA and, and submit that information as well. Um, you're also going to need to uh, submit an airworthiness release statement, uh, which uh, will come from the executive uh, within your organization uh, that um, is, is the individual that's in charge uh, of the overall operations uh, of your agency. And uh, basically, this is going to say that you, your agency, accepts all responsibility uh, for ensuring that the aircraft is airworthy uh, and that it will be maintained um, in uh, compliance with you know, your uh, certification criteria. Um, next, you're going to submit uh, an emergency procedures and protocol uh, description. So, you 
you know, really the FAA's chief concern with anything that we do in our national airspace system is safety. Um, so you need to document uh, the capabilities of the system and uh, how it will respond in certain emergency situations. Uh, so if uh, you were to lose uh, a data link, if you were to lose that command and control signal, um, you know, what's going to happen with the aircraft? How is that situation going to be rectified? Um, also, uh, this would include any emergency procedures uh, that you've put together for various instances such as uh, degradation of a GPS signal, um, electromagnetic or, or magnetometer interference, uh, collisions, um, right-of-way issues with other aircraft, um, you know, power management issues, etc. Basically, every uh, possible eventuality, you know, what will you do uh, if uh, the, these worst case scenarios um, uh, evolve. Uh, and then finally, uh, the uh, overall training uh, and operator training and certification uh, procedures that your agency will adopt. So um, one of the benefits of uh, the, the what used to be, I will say, the original benefit uh, of the public use COA was back before we had Part 107 regulations, um, there was uh, the, the, uh, the first um, you know, kind of avenue that was available for unmanned aircraft use uh, for civil operators was called uh, a Section 333 exemption. And uh, the public use uh, COA was basically the public agency equivalent uh, to uh, the Section 333 exemption. Uh, and um, during that uh, phase, uh, you know, obviously the FAA had not established operator certification requirements, things like that. So um, the agencies or the individuals that were requesting, um, you know, the the ability to operate these aircraft had to describe, uh, you know, what they were going to do to train and prepare their operators uh, to be able to uh, to fly them. Uh, so, you know, um, you, you do have the ability to uh, develop your own internal training and certification program, and that's what you know many agencies had to do prior to part the release of Part 107. Um, however, now that we have Part 107 regulations, uh, if you are going to be using standard Standard small unmanned aircraft systems uh, and flying, you know, largely in compliance with those Part 107 regulations. A lot of agencies uh, can basically just adopt um, Part 107 operator certification as their training uh, um, procedures plan and submit that uh, to kind of streamline uh, this overall process. All right, moving on to the next slide. Um, so uh, just to, to kind of go over part 107, um, so I mentioned that, you know, from about 2012 um, up until uh, part 107 was launched in 2016, uh, the public use COA and the section 333 exemptions for civil operators, uh, they were the only way uh, that we could get access to be able to use unmanned aircraft uh, in, uh, in our national airspace system. Um, and when part 107 came out in 2016, this established framework uh, for civil uh, commercial operations uh, of uh, these uh, these smaller unmanned aircraft. Um, the, the Part 107 refers to the specific uh, um, section or, or uh, area within the Federal Aviation Regulations or, or FARs where we would find uh, these regulations for civil uh, and commercial use of uh, the aircraft. And um, within uh, their their pages, we receive uh, we see a lot of uh, guidance. And so we get uh, operational limitations um, uh, on the aircraft. So what we can do, what we can't do. It uh, gives uh, the requirements uh, on how to obtain a remote pilot certificate with a small unmanned aircraft systems rating. Uh, so that would be that training and certification phase uh, for uh, these commercial uh, operators. Um, also goes into uh, the um, operator responsibilities, uh, which if you're operating under part 107, um, when it comes to liability, uh, the liability for the flight operation falls on whoever holds uh, this certificate. Um, and that's why a lot of uh, entities still uh, choose to pursue the COA, because when you uh, choose the COA, it's the agency that's basically assuming the, the bulk of the risk as opposed to the individual operator. Um, now, that doesn't mean that the individual operator is not going to be held culpable uh, in the event of gross negligence, things like that, um, especially if uh, you are using Part 107 uh, um, 
the training and certification requirements uh, to meet uh, that uh, that element for your COA for those uh, those operator uh, training protocols. Um, but it does, you know, kind of restructure and place you know more of a bulk of liability on the agency as far as uh, the individual. Um, Part 107 also, you know, was is looked upon as this first step uh, towards full integration of uh, unmanned aircraft into the national airspace system. So um, back in 2012, uh, when uh, the FAA put out what was called the Federal Modernization and Reform Act, uh, they talked about a, a lot of different uh, new and emerging technologies that they wanted to integrate uh, to make our airspace system safer, uh, allow it to handle more aircraft, and really just be more efficient, uh, kind of take us into the 21st century. Um, and one of those elements uh, that was included was the integration of unmanned aircraft. And uh, shortly after this document was released, um, they came out with a timeline and they basically said that initially by 2025, they wanted to have our airspace completely integrated for the use of unmanned aircraft um, of varying sizes, varying types, varying capabilities, doing all types of uh, different functions. So what, part 107 was was really the first, you know, long term step uh, in that overall process. And we are, you know, fully anticipating to see much more um, regulation and more framework, more guidance. Uh, coming out uh, in uh, future months and, and years. Um, so some things uh, to consider with Part 107, um, you know, again, this is when we were operating under Part 107, we are categorizing our operations as civil uh, aircraft operations, not as public. Um, so as we mentioned, the liability, uh, the individual responsibility for these flights falls on the certificate holder, um, the Part 107, uh, the, the individual that has that uh, remote pilot certificate with a small UAS rating, and they are considered the pilot in command, which uh, if you you're familiar with aviation uh, regulations at all, um, the pilot in command, you know, that's where the buck stops, uh, basically, when it comes to uh, operations uh, under standard uh, federal aviation regulations. Um, it allows, uh, an, under part, standard Part 107 provisions, we are only uh, allowed to operate during daylight hours. Um, so that's one benefit of going on the, the COA route, uh, is that, um, you know, all, basically all of the the forms of public use COAs right now allow for night operations, um, you know, pretty much immediately, um, provided that, you know, they're addressed, obviously, in your operational parameters. Um, but with Part 107, you would need to obtain a special waiver uh, to be able to do that, um, even though it is pretty straightforward to get. Uh, most of them right now, they're being granted within about 30 days, and uh, typically night uh, waivers are good for uh, four years uh, at this point. Um, also, uh, we have to get permission um, whenever we are flying in areas of controlled airspace and this has been you know a, a big pain um, for a lot of operators for the last two years uh, because the process of obtaining these authorizations was not something that came quickly um, you know most of the time uh, it took anywhere from 30 to 90 days uh, to get uh, authorizations uh, um, the authorizations were relatively limited in time, uh, so you know you you may only have an authorization for up to six months. Um, you know sometimes they were even less than that. Uh, and to get a more long-term waiver, uh, that took a, a very very long time to obtain, and uh, you know a, a lot of legwork to do that. Um, so you know when you obviously, especially when we talk about public safety and essential governmental functions, you know if you have a need. Need, you need to be able to launch that aircraft. Uh, so that's really why the, the public use COA um, became so popular uh, for agencies where controlled airspace was always in place and you never knew you know, which part uh, of that controlled airspace you may need to operate in at a moment's notice. Um, also under part 107, uh, altitude restrictions, um, which are also very common in the COA. Uh, the same uh, 400 foot uh, above ground level is standard for the, the blanket uh, COA um, at this point. So not much difference there. Um, you can request variations on this uh, as, as in the terms of your COA, but that does, you know, add complexity. It adds time to the processing and, uh, you know, can make the overall process just kind of drawn out a little bit. Um, also under part 107, all of our operations must be conducted within visual line of sight. Uh, again, that is the standard uh, for the, the baseline uh, public use COAs that we see. Um, although, you know, there are avenues to request uh, more 
advanced capabilities uh, as you're going through this. Um, again, it just adds some more time uh, and more logistics, we'll say, to preparing uh, your, your uh, argument, preparing your request, uh, and, uh, and getting that approved. Okay, moving on uh, to our, our next uh, slide. So um, part 107, waivers and operations. Uh, so if you do decide to conduct your operations under part 107, because it is a very streamlined process. Really, the only thing you have to worry about is uh, having your, your individual operators uh, pass the FAA knowledge test to get their certificates. Uh, there are, um, you know, they're, 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 you're going to be restricted, obviously, to those uh, um, base line parameters. So um, you can only fly during daylight hours, no flights over um, um, non-participants or, you know, members of the public. The aircraft cannot pass directly over uh, any non-participant. Um, we must stay within uh, vis visual line of sight. Uh, um, there can only be one unmanned aircraft flying uh, at any given time. Our maximum flight altitudes uh, are going to go up to 400 feet, um, and we must have separate authorizations uh, for flights in uh, many areas of controlled airspace, uh, especially those associated with airports that have control towers. So, you know, if for the purposes of what you're trying to accomplish with this aircraft, you would need to routinely uh, go outside of those uh, parameters, um, that would mean that either you would need to obtain waivers under Part 107 to be able to, to do that uh, when you need to, um, or uh, you could pursue uh, the public use COA um, of, a, of a particular variation uh, that will allow you to conduct uh, that operation um, as needed, when needed, uh, once that uh, document has been approved and it has been issued to you. Uh, so you wouldn't have to go through this, uh, you know, multiple Multiple times. It would be basically um, ideally a once and done sort of situation. You wouldn't be filing three, four, you know, five different types of waivers and you, know, you wouldn't have to worry about um, constantly following filing for uh, authorizations uh, to operate in, in these areas of controllable airspace. Okay, moving on to our next slide. So, um, a quick overview. Um, you know, the the key takeaways, I guess we should say here, uh, because you know, again, we've got a, a relatively short amount of time to talk about this, and there really is a, a lot of different facets to kind of look at here. But uh, that you know, really. The the quick bullet points uh, to look at um, as far as obtaining the COA uh, in many cases you know it will take longer uh, to obtain the, the particular COA that your agency is looking for uh, than it would to get uh, the standard uh, part 107 operator certificates um, basically the process of obtaining access uh, to the FAA's cap system being assigned uh, an FAA coordinator preparing the necessary documents uh, so liaising with your uh, Attorney General's office for that uh, public letter of declaration. Also then sitting down and preparing uh, all of your your various um, pieces of documentation as far as your um, executive summary, concept of operations, uh, aircraft parameters, training procedures, emergency procedures, airworthiness, uh, notifications, etc. Um, you know, that, that takes a while. Plus, you, not only do you have to prepare all of that, you also then have to wait for the FAA to adjudicate that. Now, in some cases, you know, for some of the more basic forms of uh, COA, such as the blanket COA, uh, this can happen pretty quickly um, you know in fact uh, in, in conversations that uh, I have I've had uh, with uh, the coordinators uh, with uh, the FAA they're saying that in some cases um, you know blanket COAs can be uh, granted in as little as you know a week or two uh, if um, you know it, it's very basic and, and really nothing uh, else that uh, needs to be reviewed as far as, you know, extra special, you know, considerations from an operating standpoint. Um, but the blanket COA is really not the most desirable one for most agencies, especially now that we have, um, you know, Part 107 regulations in place, because really the blanket COA still says that you have to, you can only fly five miles away from airports that do not have a control tower, um, three miles away from uh, airports that don't have control towers but that have what are called published instrument uh, approach procedures and two miles uh, away from any other public use airport. So, you know, really, um, you know, considering that uh, the Part 107 provisions uh, allow us to fly, you know, within, you know, any distance of an airport uh, unless it has an operating control tower and would be classified as controlled airspace, uh, you know, really the blanket uh, COA doesn't give us 
experience a huge uh, amount of benefit um, in that sense anymore uh, since Part 107 came out. Uh, biggest uh, benefit is really the, the night operations uh, because even the blanket COA will allow for nighttime operations uh, for public safety and, and first responders uh, uh, in um, as, as part of the baseline terms, provided that uh, the proper uh, meteorological conditions uh, exist. Um, next on the COA side, uh, again, this is only available for qualifying agencies. Uh, and, you know, you might be asking yourself or saying to yourself, you know, well, you know, our, our department is, you know, part of our local government, uh, you know, therefore we should be able to go ahead and obtain this. Um, just because uh, your your agency is part of the, gov the local government does not necessarily mean uh, that it will fall under the um, characterization of having a critical governmental function as outlined in uh, Title 49 uh, of the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, so make sure that you're, you know, you review that, you're aware of that, uh, and uh, if you have questions about that, um, you know, that is something that uh, you can you can get the answer from uh, from that uh, FAA coordinator before you really go through the 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 full on on process of, you know, going, submitting everything uh, for review, um, you know, really that determination can be made, uh, you know, fairly quickly um, at that, uh, um, at, at those early stages when you're still looking at the public letter of declaration. Um, also, uh, you know, once it's uh, once this uh, COA is issued, it will give you more flexibility. Um, so if you do need to operate uh, in an area where within your jurisdiction, uh, you've got lots of areas of controlled airspace, um, you may have a need for your particular type of operations or the goal that you're trying to accomplish to go outside of uh, those bounds, uh, that, that uh, those normal bounds of uh, Part 107 operations, then, you know, pursuing that jurisdictional COA uh, uh, would allow you to, you know, um, incorporate all of that into one initial request, and then once it's approved, you shouldn't be, you know, it shouldn't slow you down uh, as far as being able to get out there and deploy your system as needed. Um, basically, the only requirement uh, once a jurisdictional uh, COA has been issued, when it comes down to flying in areas of controlled airspace uh, that fall within your jurisdiction, uh, is that uh, you file a NOTAM uh, or a notice to airmen uh, prior to your flight. Uh, so when you need to launch the aircraft, um, you'll go through a quick online process basically to uh, file this NOTAM or you can call in uh, the NOTAM to flight services and uh, you know, it takes a few minutes to get it up there and then you're ready to launch. So you don't have to wait uh, for these lengthy uh, authorizations and you don't have to worry about obtaining authorizations and then just having to renew them every six months uh, you know, as, as uh, the need uh, arises. Um, under Part 107, you know, uh, the, the the benefit here is that uh, it is standardized, uh, so we have very clear-cut guidelines that say this is how you need to get your operator certificates. Once you have the operator certificate, those individuals can operate these aircraft based on these parameters for official uh, purposes, um, you know, uh, within the national airspace system. Uh, so it is very, very cut and dry. Uh, you know, not a whole lot of paperwork to prepare, not a whole lot of time spent uh, on the adjudication process. Um, the downside is it does only allow for daytime operation right off the bat, uh, unless you get uh, that waiver uh, that would allow for nighttime access uh, or nighttime uh, operations. So uh, if night operations uh, are going to be critical for you, which for many public safety uh, agencies they will be, um, keep that in mind. Uh, finally, liability is going to fall on the individual pilot uh, as opposed to the agency. Uh, you are not submitting an airworthiness release on, the, on behalf of the agency uh, in this case case, you know, each individual pilot who has that certificate and is serving as the pilot in command, that is where the, the liability will fall. Um, so even though, you know, liability can still fall on the operator on the public UCOA side, you know, in events of, you know, gross negligence, things like that, um, there is a little bit uh, more of an umbrella protection uh, in looking at uh, these cases as entity run uh, when we're on that side with the COA as opposed to part 107 where it will all always basically fall to the individual. Okay, uh, moving on to our next slide. So, you know, recommendations based on department size. So we're going to take a look at a few different scenarios here and uh, take a look at some of the, the factors that you want to consider when you're determining which route 
you're going to go. Um, so some of the things to look at, first of all, personnel. Um, obviously, if the, you know, if your agency is going to be covering the cost uh, to certify these operators, um, you know, it, it's a significant expense uh, when you start uh, adding up, you know, the cost of $150 minimum uh, for everyone to go and, and take the uh, FAA knowledge test and get their Part 107 certificate. So the number of individuals that you have operating, you know, will uh, come into play. Um, you know, as in, in, in part of that, uh, if you go the COA route uh, and you decide to draft your own provisions as far as operator training and, and certification, then you can avoid uh, some of those costs. Although that does, again, make the process of preparing your COA, COA request a little bit more complicated because you can't just say, well, our operators will all uh, function as uh, remote pilot certificate holders under um, you know, the parameters set out in Part 107. So it does add a, a little bit of uh, time time there. Um, jurisdiction, uh, so, you know, depending on the area uh, that your jurisdiction covers and the amount of, uh, you know, uh, airspace, things like that, uh, that fall within there, the different types of airspace that fall within there, uh, you know, that's going to uh, also uh, play a pretty big role. Um, the local airspace, uh, so as we said, sort of along the same lines with jurisdiction, uh, if, um, you know, if you've got a lot of areas of controlled airspace, uh, you know, the benefit of not having to uh, to repetitively apply for those authorizations uh, is definitely going to be a time saver going the COA route. Uh, and finally, mission requirements. Uh, so the more um, the more things that you need to do that will go outside of those standard boundaries uh, of Part 107, the Part 107 regulations. Uh, you know, the the more legwork it would be for you to obtain waivers for each of those uh, if you're operating under Part 107, and the more uh, effective method may be to instead take the time up front, document all of the different operating uh, conditions that would that you uh, anticipate to operate within, um, and then you know submit one uh, request for a jurisdictional COA uh, that will give you those enhanced uh, capabilities. It'll take more time to process up front, but in the long run, uh, you know may help out. So let's take a look and, and see at some of these uh, different uh, scenarios. So in example one, we've got a small agency, less than 50 sworn officers, no aviation unit, so uh, assuming um, a, a police law enforcement uh, agency here perhaps, uh, and uh, jurisdiction, rural, suburban, no controlled airspace, uh, so only uncontrolled airspace uh, within those areas. Um, mission requirements, uh, general small unmanned aircraft for search and rescue, uh, different uh, investigations, traffic accidents, etc. Um, in this case, you know, for the sake of, you know, time, uh, and the fact that we don't have the expense of uh, uh, certifying a ton of operators. Part 107 um, with uh, the add-on waiver for night operations may be preferred. Um, now again, uh, from the liability standpoint, uh, you know, you still have to look at that, but uh, just because the immediate liability is going to fall to the agency uh, doesn't again mean that, uh, uh, that uh, the the individual operator would still be exempt uh, in cases of gross negligence, things like that. Okay, moving on to example two. Uh, in this case, again, still a small agency with less than uh, 50 officers and no aviation unit. Uh, now we're in a suburban area as far as our jurisdiction, and uh, we are starting to see some um, some areas of controlled airspace uh, associated with larger airports with control towers. So maybe we have cl some Class Delta uh, or Class Charlie airspace within this area uh, that we're going to you know need to be able to operate in when the need arises. Uh, mission requirements have not changed, so general, small Small unmanned aircraft uh, for use with search and rescue, investigations, and traffic accidents. And uh, in this case, um, again, um, a recommendation would be Part 107 uh, initially with uh, airspace authorizations for that local airspace uh, and an add on waiver for, for night operations uh, as far as getting yourself started. Um, the reason we make the recommendation here for airspace authorization is because when you have these. Uh, we'll say lower classes or smaller airports with control towers associated with Class D uh, or perhaps some uh, areas of, of Class C, Class Charlie airspace. Uh, you know, typically getting waivers uh, for those areas has been um, relatively straightforward. And the other thing to keep in mind too is the FAA is actively rolling out a new system for instant airspace authorization uh, called the LANCE framework, which uh, is uh, already 
available at uh, I think uh, about uh, 30, somewhere between 30 and 50 airports around the country, and is anticipated to be rolled out uh, to um, between three and 500 uh, airports by the end of this year. And they have a timeline for that. So depending on which region you're in, once that comes out, you know, airspace for um, getting access to airspace, most classes of controlled airspace will be very straightforward and, and can be done instantaneously using a, a smartphone app. Um, there will be cases though with the Lance system where your altitude will be restricted uh, depending on you know how close to the airport you actually need to fly um, you know the airport in question that has these control towers um, but and there are also cases where if you're very close to the airport like within a half mile or so in certain areas you would not be able to get in an authorization so you still would have to go through uh, the manual uh, process which can take a, a bit more time okay moving on to uh, example number three uh, so here we have a mid-size agency so now we're up to 50 to 100 sworn officers still no aviation unit uh, jurisdiction now is suburban and urban and now we have some larger areas uh, of controlled airspace larger airports um, uh, busier airports will say, uh, and uh, areas where getting uh, authorization under Part 107 are going to be uh, a bit more difficult uh, and a bit more tedious uh, on the, you know, to, to keep things going long term, given the traditional uh, way that we've gotten our authorizations. So in this case, uh, mission requirements, still general use for search and rescue, traffic accidents. We're adding in search warrants and uh, tactical operations, uh, potentially with uh, SWAT teams. Um, recommendation here would be to start out potentially with part 107 uh, with maybe a few of those uh, uh, operators so not all of them but a few of them and then uh, and also applying for some er earlier airspace authorizations applying for a night waiver because they are relatively easy to obtain and then depending on the success of those authorizations um, because getting authorizations for some of our busier uh, class B or class Bravo airspace uh, has been relatively difficult uh, in certain areas um, but depending on the success then applying for the jurisdictional COA in the background so the part 107 certifications will allow uh, everyone to get up and going uh, they'll allow you to start conducting basic operations uh, and then you while you're waiting uh, for that jurisdictional COA to be prepared uh, adjudicated and then finally approved uh, by the FAA um, also if you uh, have your operators uh, pursue the part 107 uh, certifications then that takes away some of the the challenges uh, associated with developing your own uh, internal training and uh, certification programs. All right, moving on to number four. Uh, so now we have a mid-sized agency with 50 to 100 sworn officers and a helicopter unit. Uh, the jurisdiction now is urban, and we uh, do have uh, Class uh, Charlie uh, or Class Bravo airspace uh, that covers the majority of the jurisdiction. Uh, here, uh, again, general use of the aircraft, um, same sort of applications we saw before, traffic accidents, search warrants, uh, tactical applications, etc. cetera. Um, recommendation here, uh, again, uh, potentially beginning with part 107 uh, certification for a few of these officers uh, to get things off the ground, uh, start letting you uh, go through proof of concept and, and develop some of your operational parameters using the aircraft in the areas that you can, but in this case, simultaneously applying for that jurisdictional COA because of the fact that a large portion of your jurisdiction is going to be covered by these more advanced and, uh, and larger, more difficult uh, 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 to obtain areas uh, of uh, controlled airspace, um, so more difficult to obtain those authorizations, I should say. So uh, in this case, you know, e even though you're going to be doing Part 107 potentially for the number of pilots that you have that will be operating, um, you know, and, and not having to worry about your own internal training and certification plan, uh, you know, your actual operational parameters, uh, having those governed by uh, the COA um, is going to be better for you in that long term uh, at this point. Okay, moving on. 
So example five, large agency, 100 plus uh, sworn officers with a helicopter unit, countywide jurisdiction, multiple airports, many different uh, varies, uh, varieties of, uh, of different classes of controlled airspace, um, same general applications that we talked that we've been talking about already. Um, recommendation here, uh, as we've seen and, and continue to see, having that small trial group of officers uh, going through part 107 certification, but at the same time uh, going ahead and, and preparing that jurisdictional COA, um, this is going to be uh, the preferred method because long term with the variety of different classes of airspace and the scope uh, of your jurisdiction, the, the breadth of the areas that you cover, um, you know, it is going to save you a lot of hassle from an operational standpoint to not have to worry about uh, obtaining those authorizations on either a case by case basis uh, or obtaining, you know, six month authorizations and then constantly having to renew them uh, as as, as time goes on, um, you know, that's going to, to really help out. Uh, plus, you know, if you do then uh, decide to have more of these officers flying, uh, much like we saw with the last example, you do have the option of developing your own training and certification plan uh, when you're putting together your request for a jurisdictional COA. So uh, you can have more officers then capable of flying these without the added expense of uh, the, the FAA certification as far as those testing requirements requirements. Okay, moving on. So um, before we, you know, open things up to questions, you know, just one, you know, final note uh, that I'd like to, to make on this, you know, or, or a couple of things I should say, um, you know, first of all, again, recognize that uh, it's very important to determine, A, will your agency be uh, eligible uh, for the public use COA before you go in uh, and start uh, the process of uh, putting all this paperwork together uh, only to find out that uh, you are not going to be able to um, move forward with that, uh, you know, depending on how things are structured and, and where your mandate comes from uh, within, you know, your own individual uh, governmental uh, umbrellas. Uh, also, um, recognize that, you uh, um, you know the one of the uh, the potential benefits of the uh, the COA uh, being that uh, the liability is going to fall on the agency as opposed to the individual operator. That you know is only going to be true uh, to the extent of you know uh, of standard operations issues of gross negligence uh, things like that um, or issues that arise uh, if your training and certification program is um, solely uh, Part 107 uh, operator certificates. Basically, you know. That's uh, that's going to you know kind of bring some things into question, and um, you know in terms of kind of what we're seeing happen with uh, airspace right now, and what we're seeing with the evolution of Part 107 uh, certificates and the Part 107 um, regulations themselves, you know getting access to areas of controlled airspace for many of our flights is going to get much easier uh, with this land system. So although, you know, um, a year ago, two years ago, uh, three years ago, uh, public use COAs were probably, you know, almost certainly the way to go, uh, you know, if you were especially a public safety first responder uh, group uh, that, that had a mandate uh, from uh, your governmental uh, agent, your, your governmental body. Um, now, you know, we kind of want to look at things a little bit closer and really see, you know, what is going to make the most sense for us. Um, because, you know, in the eyes of the FAA, COAs are never really meant to be permanent solutions. Uh, they are temporary solutions until uh, specific framework and regulations can be developed that will support uh, the ongoing operations. So we still see, you know, a lot of COA requests because of the limitations imposed uh, with Part 107 currently, but we also know that those current regulations uh, in Part 107 and new regulations that will that are going to be coming out uh, that will also, um, you know, fully or, or also further start uh, continue this integration process of unmanned aircraft in our in our national airspace system, um, you know, there, the things are changing and uh, the, the long-term benefits of the public use COA, you know, may not necessarily be, uh, um, you know, uh, may not necessarily be appropriate uh, for your agency when we're looking, you know, another two, three, five years into the future. Um, so that being said, uh, I'll ask Alicia if uh, we got uh, more uh, information here, if we have any questions. Yeah, thanks, Helen. Um, so we did get a few questions, and we do have a few minutes left, so um, we'll answer we'll answer some of those. Uh, so, Colin, someone said, "How quickly can additional non-COA contractor air aircraft 
be added to an approved COA when extra drones are needed? So um, what, what I would say with that, uh, I have not gone through uh, the process of adding on these, um, you know, adding on additional aircraft uh, once an, an initial COA has been obtained. However, what I will tell you is that the adjudicator or the liaison from the FAA that you're assigned to uh, when you're going through the initial process, you will have their information and you will have have a one-on-one -on -one direct line of communication with them. So, you know, if you do need to add additional aircraft on, you would be able to get back in touch with that individual uh, and they would be able to, you know, give you some more guidance on the timeline. Um, in my, if I were to, uh, you know, give you my educated opinion on this, you know, having gone through uh, the process, um, you know, from a traditional sense, also looking back at the old Section 333 exemption process before we had a standard list of uh, small unmanned aircraft that uh, would be approved for that, I would say it should be pretty quickly. Um, and in fact, you know, really, if the aircraft system that uh, you're acquiring as a new system is included on one of the FAA's lists of uh, approved uh, systems that they are aware of and have evaluated, then it would almost be instantaneous, uh, I would say. Um, with this, the, In the later days of Section 333, before Part 107 came out, they had a list of uh, probably close to about a, you know, about 500 or so different aircraft uh, that they had already evaluated and basically uh, approved. So for those uh, individuals that had COAs under Section 333, we did not have to submit new paperwork to add additional aircraft once that list came out. So if it is a manufactured system and it still falls under the, the guidelines of a small system, so less than 55 pounds, I would say it's going to be fairly quickly. Uh, but your, uh, your liaison at the FAA uh, that's assigned during the initial request would definitely be able to help you with that. Great. And then another question we got is, are NGOs like Red Cross qualifying for a COA? You know, that's uh, an interesting question. So, um, you know, the not nonprofit. It's uh, so 501c3s. Uh, if you read through the uh, the FAA's uh, literature on the topic and things, um, there there are pathways available uh, to get uh, a COA um, for those operations um, because it, you know you are a publicly funded entity uh, in that point. Um, the question, I guess, you know, really comes down to: uh, Will the FAA uh, sign off on things? As you know, is this an essential uh, function of your uh, overall organization? So, in other words, must you use SUAS uh, in a particular area uh, to be able to accomplish what you want? And would you not be able to uh, operate the uh, the aircraft uh, under the standard terms of ex regulations that currently exist, like Part 107? So, you know, in some cases, and this is where really, you know, you may find yourself um, being better served by having an aviation attorney uh, help you with these requests, because, you know, if you submit uh, that initial uh, documentation, uh, that initial uh, letter of declaration, et cetera, uh, that um, you know basically defines uh, who you are and, and your purposes. And uh, the um, uh, the powers that be come back and say, well, under you know uh, Title Forty Nine of uh, the Code of Federal Regulations, you know we're gonna we're questioning uh, your your uh, your um, you know we'll say uh, entitlement uh, to this particular document. Uh, you know having a, a legal uh, uh, team on your side or a, a legal representative that could argue that uh, if the initial result is unfavorable uh, is going to be a benefit. You know, we can help, uh, we can assist with the process of preparing your documentation for submittal. We can guide you through the process of working with the FAA and, and answering some of your questions to clarify things. But uh, as far as, you know, actually fighting a legal battle, um, we, you know, we are not attorneys. Uh, so, you know, really we're kind of, uh, uh, you know, what we can do is lead you up into the point where the FAA says, you know, either yes or no, your agency is or is not going to qualify. Beyond that, uh, if they say no, that's something that bringing in a legal representative is, is going to be able to help out with. Great, thanks. And then we'll cover one more question. Someone said, could um, jurisdictional COAs potentially be statewide for a state agency? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so if you're a state, ag if you are a state agency, if you are, you know, a state police organization, um, you know, whatever the case might be, and you know, the the governmental body that you report to is the state government, uh, and, and that's where your mandate comes from, and you serve the entire state. Absolutely, you know, that is your jurisdiction. Uh, so you can do that. Now, the process of you know documenting everything and uh, preparing that request, um, it would be very lengthy uh, to be able to you know address and identify all the various areas of controlled airspace uh, with uh, that would be affected within your state so it would take a little bit more time to prepare um, but most definitely yes yeah, state statewide uh, is a jurisdiction so yes you would be able to pursue that great thanks Colin so that's all the time we have but thank you everyone so much for joining us today I will be sending out an email with a recording of today's webinar as well as a copy of the slide deck so keep an eye out for that and also let us know if any other questions do come up. Um, we've trained over 70 uh, public safety departments and we'd be happy to use our knowledge to get your program off the ground. So thank you again, everyone, and we hope to see you in the future.